I've got a soft spot for black sheep. This goes all the way back to Deus Ex Invisible War. My first time playing this was not a good experience. Or rather it seemed that way at the time, but that later turned out to be something else. Steeped in the hype of being the sequel to the greatest game ever made, yes, this is the greatest game ever, the Game Awards is a joke and doesn't have a clue what it's talking about. But we all knew that anyway. With all the hype and expectations surrounding it, it ultimately fell so far short as a Deus Ex game that it wouldn't be until a few years later when, detached from all the buzz, and with my expectations now held in check, I replayed it and actually found myself having a really good time with it. I realised then that I had let my disappointment completely ruin my experience with it. I've since gone on to be very sceptical about hype, including the opinions of easily bribed journalists and the often obnoxious roar of social media. These days, I try to judge a game based on the experience I'm getting over the one I think I should be getting. Sure, it's fine to think that a sequel is disappointing when weighed against other titles in its series, but disappointing is not the same as bad. Which brings us to Blood Omen 2, a very interesting entry in the series. Being developed by an entirely different team than Amy Hennig's Soul Reaver crew, they did everything in their power to distance themselves from Soul Reaver and even the original Blood Omen, so they could have the freedom to express themselves creatively. As such, we have a game that feels like a massive departure from the main series. The game foregoes the classic gothic fantasy aesthetic for something more like steampunk. Set in the, as yet unheard of, City of Meridian, during a period of great industrial revolution, the game introduces a new story, setting, cast, and lots of new enemies to face. It's no wonder that some people reacted badly to this shift in tone and gameplay. I myself didn't actually play this game until now, having heard only mediocre reviews and not being overly impressed with anything I'd seen of it in magazines. So maybe the game just got a bad rap for being a weaker entry in such a strong series. On the other hand, some games are just bad. Whether it's developer or publisher issues, some games are just a mess of bad mechanics, awful storytelling, and jarring visuals. And you can bet all of that was going through my mind when I fired this up for the first time. So how was it? Let's find out. This is Blood Omen 2. <laughs> I think I'll start at the end with this one and say that I did have a good time with this game. Not a great time. Not an oh my god what time. Or a tear jerking time. But there are a lot of elements about this game that I really liked, and I'm really glad I got to explore this part of Nosgoth at this time and learn a little more about Kane's legacy. There are, however, quite a few things that I didn't like. But I'd say my overall impression is a net positive. Specifically, I love the environment design, the traversal mechanics, and the variety of interesting puzzles in the game. The City of Meridian is absolutely fascinating, and really exciting to explore. It's full of little environmental quirks and is very dark and foreboding. I was equally impressed with the gothic sci-fi vibes of the Hilden City, and it was really cool to get a look under the hood at what these guys are really like. Unfortunately, the story isn't up to much. It ranges from bland to pretty stupid if I'm being honest. Most of the new characters are either forgettable cardboard cutouts or just annoying. There's a bizarre last minute attempt to try and shoehorn some kind of character development into Kane that's really jarring and doesn't make any sense at all. I'll get to that later though. For now, let's start with the story. <laughs> the story of Blood Omen 2 is not good. Not only is it a massive departure in tone and quality from Soul Reaver, it's also just a mess of fantasy cliches and plot holes. It feels very amateurish, if I'm being honest, which wasn't exactly uncommon for games of that era. Hell, even games of the current generation still have nonsensical plots filled with two-dimensional characters with no apparent motivation, so to speak. Magic MacGuffins that can solve all the world's problems, and complex military and political systems 
that will for some reason completely collapse if the leader is defeated. As Umar told you, we must kill the Seraphan Lord. When he is dead, their power will crumble. Now the setup is great, though that's because it's mostly handled by the meta-narrative spun by Amy Hennig, but the execution is where it fails hard. If I was feeling generous, I'd say this could be enjoyed as brainless fun. Kinda like when you and your friends get together to watch old Godzilla movies with no subtitles and make up the script as you go. I'm not a creator who's all that interested in doing hit pieces though. I mean, the day this channel hits 10,000 subs, I might do a video on Anthem, but otherwise I'd like to stay positive about the games I cover. After all, even the bad ones are the result of a lot of work done by large teams who often pulled a lot of overtime to meet deadlines. As such, I'm going to forgo the usual story play-by-play -play here and just cover the very broadest strokes of the plot. Blood Omen 2 doesn't exist within the original Legacy of Cain timeline. These events came about as a result of Cain saving Raziel from imprisonment within the Reaver at the end of Soul Reaver 2. Once time had reshuffled itself, these events appeared within Cain's memories, hence his warning. My god, the Hilden! We walked right into their trap. The story itself begins long before that though, within the Hennig meta-narrative. As Raziel discovers through the various murals he sees in the Reaver Forges, and his conversations with Janos Audren, in time long past, the race of winged beings warred with another race, known as the Hilden. This ended with the Hilden being banished from Nosgoth, and the pillars being erected as a lock to keep them out. The magical binding was kept strong by the Guardians, the first of whom were chosen from the winged race. However, in a final act of defiance against their enemies, the Hilden cursed the winged creatures. They became immortal and sterile, but also began to crave human blood to sustain themselves. They became the first vampires. As time passed, the first guardians fell to despair and ended their own lives. Since the pillars choose their guardians at birth, their custody fell into the care of humans, and the binding began to weaken. History rolled on, and the first Seraphan vampire purges began. As the binding grew weaker still, a Hilden presence was able to enter into Nosgoth, take possession of Mortanius, the Guardian of Death, and assassinate Ariel, the Balance Guardian. This act spelt the doom of the pillars and sealed the fate of Cain. With the pillars destroyed, the Hilden were able to work their way back into Nosgoth. However, they were still bound to the demonic realm. To this end, they sought out an ancient and powerful artifact called the Nexus Stone, a magical MacGuffin that can bend the fabric of space and time and open a portal to the demonic realm, allowing the Hilden to return. Time passed, and the Hilden infiltrated the capital city of Meridian, while Cain revived Vorador, who in turn sired a new vampire race. These formed Cain's first army, and he began his conquest of Nosgoth. As Cain's power grew, the Hilden Lord used the old legends of the Seraphan to unite the people under his banner and organize a great force to fight back. In the end, he succeeded in convincing members of Cain's inner circle to betray him and lead him into an ambush outside the city. Here, the Seraphan Lord armed himself with the Nexus Stone, rendering himself invulnerable to the Soul Reaver. There was a great battle, and Cain was defeated, and his army shattered. Two hundred years pass, and finally, Cain awakens again. The shards of tattered dreams I rose, unwilling, tossed upon tides of pain that flowed and ebbed and left me searingly awake, and more revoltingly, Alive. It was then I saw her for the first time. This is Uma, 
And if you think Kane's somewhat impressive opening monologue is foreshadowing some kind of relationship with deep character development for our arrogant vampire king, well, I'm afraid you're going to be very disappointed. Kane's mind is shattered. He knows his name and his nature, but much of his past is a mystery. This is all a very convenient way to reset our protagonist from the absolute powerhouse he was at the end of Blood Omen to someone who needs to be concerned with the attacks of the average thug, and also provide opportunity for Uma to drop big exposition dumps for series newcomers. And there's a lot of exposition here. I don't want to get too negative here, but I really didn't like this tutorial. It was really drawn out and Uma is very condescending through it all. So the setup is that after Kane's fall, the remaining vampires either fled into hiding within the city of Meridian, or joined the new Seraphan Order as enforcers and spies. Kane's body was found, his life all but extinguished by the vampires loyal to him. They formed a secret order known as the Cabal, and as well as hiding Kane's body and nurturing it slowly back to health, they began to wage a covert guerrilla war against the new Seraphan Order, who now impose an almost tyrannical martial law over Meridian, and use the fear of the vampire's return as a way to control the populace. For 200 years the Cabal have been fighting back, but they are losing the battle. They have returned Kane to have him join their fight because... We need you to help the resistance. Our faces are known, they kill us on sight. I'm sorry, one more time. Our faces are known, they kill us on sight. So, you've brought back this six-foot, bleach-white skinned, yellow-eyed, silver-maned, shirtless viking, whose image is plastered on giant murals all around the city because... Our faces are known, they kill us on sight. Okay, so that's definitely one of the plans you could have gone with, but let me suggest an alternative. Have you or any of the Cabal considered going outside in anything other than fetish clothes? So, no then. Real big-brained operation we've got running here. Uma takes Kane on a tour of the slums, and we see that this city is a truly fascinating place. At this time, Meridian is in the midst of an industrial revolution, powered by the incredible glyph magic that the Seraphan have introduced. A silent and secret order known as the Glyphrites maintain all this new magitech, and of the many benefits it provides, vampire warded gates are one of them. So with everything set up, it's up to Kane to once again murder his way across Meridian, defeat the former lieutenants who betrayed him, increase his power, claim the Nexus Stone as his own, defeat the dastardly schemes of the Hilden, reclaim the Soul Reaver, and seal the portal to the demonic realm for good. Probably the biggest twist we find is that Janos Audren is not only alive, but is being held captive by the Hilden, and having his power drained to fuel the terrible device that will kill everyone or something. When we first encounter Janos, he is in a kind of feral state. Centuries of starvation and having his power drained have devolved him much like what happened to Raziel's brothers. He is later restored to his former glory and even assists Kane in the final battle, though it doesn't exactly end well for him. I sentence you to the hell of your own making. A prisoner for all time. No! Kane! Yikes. So... Nothing mind-blowingly original, really. The story has its moments, but it's nothing special. <laughs> the environmental design is without a doubt the highlight of this game. I really love this setting, and even the rationale behind it. It always struck me as kind of odd that in worlds like the Elder Scrolls, technology and fashion seems to be stuck permanently in a kind of Tolkien-esque fantasy style, despite hundreds of years passing between games. Most fantasy settings get hung up on the idea of magic being shunned, feared, and lorded over the masses by the few, when it seems much more likely that it would become a very profitable institution. It simply needs packaging and presenting in a way that anyone can use. To this end, I have a soft spot for the steampunk genre, and it's really cool to see some of this in Nosgoth. In Blood Omen and Soul Reaver 2, we are looking at Nosgoth's past, and in Soul Reaver 1, the world has all but ended. But here, in the middle so to speak, 
We can catch a glimpse of the world and the civilizations that, for example, built the Silence Cathedral or the Drowned Abbey. And we can see them embrace a convenient new form of technology, even in the face of oppression, or perhaps, especially in the face of oppression. After all, taxes may be high and personal freedom may be at an all-time low, but if you've got your glyph magic lights and heating, maybe it's not so bad. Another thing I really like about Meridian are the small conversations that you can overhear and little environmental storytelling touches that you can see all over the place. Early on in the game, you overhear one couple talking about increased taxes and how the Seraphan are saying it's to protect them from vampire threats. The fact that people don't usually see vampires is seen as confirmation that the payments are working rather than as a sign that they might be being manipulated just a little. I also really like how the citizens react to Cain using his powers to glide in public. Some guards won't even attack unless you do something overt. It's a really nice touch, except... Look at this guy. Come on guys, just how stupid are you? In Blood Omen, Cain had to find two separate disguise powers to move freely among mortals and not get attacked. So it seems very odd that with him further along in his evolution, and with the idea of vampire threats being pushed by the current ruling power, that people wouldn't notice this. Getting back to the environment design though, it really does paint a picture of a world steeped in oppression. The slums in the lower city are covered in a thick fog, and the colour implies the air isn't all that clean. There is so much dirt and filth here. We see broken walls and fences, doors that are boarded up, and steam that rises up from vents leading to great churning machines down below. Gangs roam the area and fight openly in the streets, sometimes within meters of uncaring militia. One early game area is called the Smuggler's Den, and the buildings have this wonderful feeling of just being randomly stacked on top of each other, like people were just cramming spaces into here any way they could, with no consideration for how it might all fit together. We also get to visit industrial areas full of colossal machines that serve no apparent purpose. Maybe they help with the construction of those colossal metal steamers we see later in the game. Meridian is also a place of massive class divide. We discover this when we visit the Upper City while searching for the Bishop of Meridian. The Upper City exists in stark contrast to the Lower while maintaining the game's aesthetic. Things are much cleaner. Streets are cobbled, and the architecture borders on spectacular. The main focal points here are the cathedral and the bishop's mansion. And since Kane now has his jump power too, it's put to good use in some breathtaking rooftop traversal moments. We even get a look at how the wealthy get about in this age of technological wonders. Horseless carriages. What a truly remarkable time to be alive. But we're not done yet. Not by a long way. Meridian is great, but it gets better. Narratively speaking, the Eternal Prison is an area that some consider to be a bit of a bad move on behalf of the Blood Omen 2 writers. It's not their worst crime, but it's the only area that simply doesn't fit at all. It isn't mentioned in any other game, either before or after this one, and there simply isn't enough information about it in this game to justify its existence. I don't mind a bit of mystery, but there's an acceptable level, so to speak. There's a lot we don't know about the Elder God, for example. Is it truly the Wheel of Fate? Or is it a parasite attached to it, as Raziel thinks? Even though we never find out, he fits into the story, and we know enough about him, it, to accept it. This place literally drops out of the sky and then never gets mentioned again, which for a prison of eternal torment is a bit strange to say the least. None of this stops it being a wonderfully designed level though. The look and feel of the architecture calls to mind games like Quake, and they waste no time highlighting how bleak and hopeless this place is. All about is a vast dark ocean, and given this is Nosgoth, I can only imagine what terrors lie within. Traversing through the Eternal Prison makes use of a lot of teleporting and... Hello? What do we have here? That looks very familiar. However, given that everyone confined here seems incapable of dying, at least not until Kane comes along to take care of the problem, I can't imagine a soul-devouring parasite being on board with this place's existence. Now, this bizarre centerpiece is a real treat. It's really atmospheric here, 
And honestly, the more you explore, the more questions you find yourself asking. The Guardians refer to this as some kind of experiment too, and they themselves look like nothing else we've ever seen in this game. This is a really interesting area. It just belongs in another game, if I was being honest. Had something been said about it in other entries, I'd be far more accepting of it, but its existence and the logic of who gets sent there and why doesn't make a lot of sense at all. Finally, we have the Hilden City. And believe me when I say the developers really saved the best for last. I mean, just look at this place. We've had a steampunk city, Quake 1 gothic sci-fi, and now Quake 2 with some Mars attacks thrown in for good measure. Honestly, I absolutely love seeing this kind of sci-fi blended into the Kane setting, and I can't deny it really works. It especially fits with the Hilden character design, and there are just so many great moments in this level, such as the boarding of this ship, being attacked by this strange UFO thing, the approach to the final boss fight, and... Well, I'm not sure what these people are actually doing here, but it sure does add to the atmosphere of this place. All in all, exploring this place at this time is a real treat, and may very well be worth the problems that exist in other areas of the game. <laughs> Blood Omen 2 introduces a lot of new characters into the Kane canon. Since the game operates in its own microcosm, and has little to no impact on the main story, well, except for this, and this, no! Kane! That's just brutal. The existence of these characters doesn't amount to much. The traitor members of Kane's army, for example, exist to be boss fights and ultimately power up Kane through their defeats. In this way, they probably get about as much screen time as Raziel's brothers, and yet, where they were all unique, memorable encounters, whose fortresses and their vampire descendants told great stories about them and foreshadowed their fights very well. These guys are just, well, pretty forgettable. With the possible exception of Magnus, they all have the same smug personality and only stand out because of their absurd outfits. Not by much, mind you. At best, they are bland and forgettable. At worst, they feel like Legacy of Kane MySpace OCs. Each fight has one unique mechanic to it that keeps things interesting for a while but they amount to little more than spongy regular grunts overall. Then there's Uma. Now, I think this character had some potential, but like so much of this game, it falls short. There's quite a lot to unpack here, and it's a little difficult to know exactly where to begin. Uma is... really annoying. At the start of the game, during a far too drawn out, unskippable tutorial section, she acts as your guide, introducing Kane and by extension the player to the various game mechanics, as well as some background on the world and how we all got to where we are now. I think her voice actor, Elizabeth Wardland, is doing a pretty good job, but the material she's working with is very cringy. Just because this is a fantasy setting doesn't mean that characters have to say I know not, rather than I don't know. Now, these kinds of tutorials were quite common in games of the era, and Blood Omen 2 had some experimental mechanics. This is partly to differentiate it from Soul Reaver, but also because it was the PS2 era, and a lot of experimentation happened at this time. The issue here is that this whole section takes way too long, and Uma, Far from showing any kind of endearing quality, and bringing us on board with the idea of her as an ally, just comes off as really condescending. There really was no reason to have her explain that vampires have claws, for example. I think it's pretty obvious to anyone, especially the six-foot marble-skinned viking feral creature she's talking to at this point. Honestly, this is something that I'm really glad is mostly a relic of the past. I recently started playing Salt and Sanctuary, and man was I grateful for how they handled tutorials in that one. This tutorial is actually the most screen time we get with Uma. She appears at other points in the game, and given she's the only member of the Cabal, these guys, who actually goes out, we're supposed to be on board with the idea that she's some kind of really competent super agent within their number. 
despite the fact that she gets herself captured by the Seraphon at an early point in the plot, and then later beaten into a bloody pulp by them. At a climactic point in the game, she turns on Kane, an action that doesn't make any sense either. Vorador is her sire, and he's the one who orchestrated the whole plan to bring Kane back into the fight. She's been invested in this plan since the start, been rescued from certain death by him, seen him overcome problems that the entire Cabal hasn't been able to deal with for around 200 years, and then suddenly she decides she doesn't trust him? Which is kind of smart, I agree. But also, that she can do a better job of overthrowing the Seraphon Lord than Cain, despite a massive amount of evidence to the contrary? This betrayal provokes the expected reaction from Cain, when he finds her almost dead at the hands of several Glyph Knights, and desperately in need of vampire blood to restore herself. Again, given that she's the one who's been telling Cain how dangerous the Glyph Knights are, and the Seraphon Lord is, I can't figure out why she suddenly decides she was better suited to do this than he. And to top it all off, what is going on with this line? You should never have betrayed me. You could have been my queen. Okay. Oh. Now, you have left me alone. These two have had absolutely no chemistry at all through this entire game. And suddenly, she could have been his queen because, well, the other female vampires in the Cabal never speak, I guess? And then, when Cain finally confronts the Seraphine Lord, there's this line. But every traitor that you have turned to your will from my side, even Uma, your latest spy, is dead. Uma. I have no spy called Uma. You lie! Again, why? As if Kane was so attached to this empty shell of bad writing that he couldn't face the idea of Uma just betraying him of her own ends and had to fabricate the idea in his mind that it was part of an elaborate conspiracy by his arch enemy. Sorry to rant everyone, but this really is bad. And while I can find things to enjoy in other areas of the game, I've got to call this as I see it. And unfortunately... We're not done yet. So, what the hell is any of this? What am I even looking at here? Okay, sure. I get that vampires have powerful regeneration abilities, so armor is kinda pointless, and would probably just restrict their speed and movement. Likewise, they're not affected by the elements, so again, clothes aren't going to be a big deal for them. But do you remember this line? Our faces are known, they kill us on sight. Okay. Let's compare these two to Elder Kane and Raziel from Soul Reaver. I look at these two and I immediately know what they're about. Their silhouettes are powerful, and Kane's skin looks solid, like swords would just bounce off it. Raziel's body tells the story of his destruction and rebirth. The skin flayed from him, and no internal organs to be seen, just powerful blue muscle, but not bulky. I can actually imagine how he would move just from this one picture. He's also rocking dangerous claws, and those burning eyes, oversized to make them more expressive, and compensate for not being able to see much of his face. That's another point. His cloak covering his mouth tells me there's something beneath it that maybe I'd rather not see. Kane's face is stony, and he wears a royal red cape with his standard on it. I don't have to know his story to know who this is and what he's about. Contrast that with these two. So, what is this for? Uma is in her underwear because... Look, I'm not one of those don't sexualize women in fantasy types. Go ahead and sexualize all the women you want. And the men too, for that matter. But there's no function to any of this outfit. The cape doesn't serve any purpose, and again... Aren't they supposed to be fighting a covert guerrilla war and keeping a low profile? Dress down, guys. So yeah, it's kinda cringy. I could make observations about most of the other characters and enemy designs, but I think I've been down on this game for too long now. Now, these guys. These are well designed. The Hilden have this awesome Mars Attacks aesthetic that really leans into the pulp Golden Age comics feel the artists were going for. I mean, I think that's what they were going for. It's the only way I can explain this, even if the writing doesn't match up to it. 
I really love these guys. There's basically two distinct styles here, scientist and warrior. But it's pretty easy to see what these guys are about and how much trouble they might give you. The Hilden Lord is especially badass. His armor has a good mix of form and function. Yes, it's way over the top in a Warhammer sort of way, but you have to wonder just how strong this guy is to wear this into battle on foot. And that burning skull helmet? That's intimidating. It's clearly very functional, encasing him from harm, but also utterly terrifying to look at. Imagine this tank storming towards you on the battlefield while you rapidly take stock of all the stupid life choices you made to put you in this situation. It's a real shame that his fight at the end doesn't amount to much, but he's otherwise a great enemy. The story does a really good job of setting him up as a powerful force that should be feared, and I really like how Kane can't wrap his head around the idea that this absolute tank who beat him into a 200 year coma the last time they fought is just too strong for him. It's, well, in Japanese they say Sasuga, which sort of means as expected, but can be used endearingly for personality traits. I did enjoy this fight. The arena, the setup, the little gimmicky range battle at the start, it was satisfying. And given everything I'd been through just to get here, including crashes, I was kind of glad that it wasn't so tough in the end. <laughs> At its core, Blood Omen 2 is a lot like Soul Reaver. However, where Soul Reaver's animations were fluid and even bestial, Blood Omen 2's are clunky and mechanical. This is very true of how most of the mechanics work, from traversal to combat. From the get-go, you're encouraged to feed on as many people as you can, as not only will you acquire blood to increase your health, but also increase the secondary purple bar called the Vampire Lore. Every time this caps out, you'll get this hilarious level-up style animation, and Kane's health will be increased. It soon becomes apparent that draining every civilian is going to be a waste of time though, as it's such a slow process and they provide the least lore when compared to Glyph Knights and other powerful enemies. On a side note, I really like the inclusion of the chained up humans along with the sound effects from Blood Omen that go with them. Kane's physical prowess is complemented by the dark gifts that he acquires throughout the game. These assist in both his traversal and combat. We'll look deeper at the combat skills later, but for now, let's talk traversal. As well as being jaw-dropping and mysterious, the levels in this game are really tightly designed, and the puzzles are varied and interesting. Let's be real. A puzzle at its heart is bringing the right coloured key to the right door. In some cases, a series of keys may be needed, but it's basically lock and key. What makes them interesting is how they fit into the world beyond being a game mechanic, and Blood Omen 2 really lands this part. There are a variety of challenges to overcome, machines to operate, glyphs to power up, one interesting endgame puzzle has you lighting a lighthouse so that ships can sail out of the way. A little later in the game, Kane acquires the charm power from Marcus. This is one of the callbacks to Blood Omen, as Kane had similar powers there. It allows Kane to take possession of civilian NPCs, and as he only needs line of sight to do so, usually, it gives him access to areas he wouldn't normally be able to reach. So, a door may be locked from the other side, or a switch may be high up and out of reach, but a quick possession will take care of that. Now, to be clear, this game is nothing like an immersive sim. While Kane has a variety of powers at his disposal, there is only one correct way to solve each puzzle. This game is very linear, with little to no backtracking in its design. All of the levels do make great use of verticality, especially once the jump power is unlocked. This is a really cool power, though the method of activating it and telekinesis is needlessly clunky. Though, needlessly clunky is a good word to describe how it feels playing this game in general. It does however make for great traversal. Once it's all put together though, you get some wonderful puzzle platforming, as Kane hurls himself across rooftops to power glyph devices before taking possession of machine operators to move an obstruction, and occasionally drop something devastating on an awaiting enemy. There are other switches that need telekinesis to activate them, and all of this is blended really well. There isn't a single throwaway ability in Kane's arsenal, and it's all put together with some really solid level design. The combat though, well, that's something of a mixed bag. So the combat. Oh boy, the combat in this game. 
It goes from too basic at the start to actually kind of fun from, I'd say after the time you defeat Faustus and get the jump power, until the mid game, to kind of a drag in the late game with spongier enemies. It's a real shame because with only a few minor tweaks, it could have been really good all the way through. So, like with Soul River 2, this game has a lot of blocking with no way to break your opponent's guard. But unlike that game, you can't just run past a big chunk of it when it gets too tedious. Like most of the basics, you're introduced to the combat during the very drawn out tutorial section with Uma, and defense is prioritized first. And well, I wasn't exactly impressed when I saw this. Okay, old game, right? Mmm, okay, older game. Even older game. So yeah, not a great first impression. But laying down a combo and releasing a fury attack is at least visceral and satisfying. And that's something I want to be clear about here. When this combat is at its very best, it's really fun and will have you dodging and defending before coming back to lay down some serious hell on your enemies. In those moments, it's great. It's just that, as the game goes on, those moments become less and less. We also get introduced to the grab function at this stage. This is a feature that I almost never used throughout my entire time with the game, as it's very slow and unintuitive and doesn't really add anything of value to the combat. Basically, when enemies have sustained enough damage, they will become fatigued and susceptible to a grab attack. Kane can then throw them away or perform an execution if he's got a weapon. The problem is, the game, despite over explaining a lot of pointless stuff in the tutorial, We are all armed with a natural weapon. Our claws. No, I'm not going to let this go. Does nothing to telegraph what a fatigued enemy looks like, and given they can just be pummeled into defeat anyway, I don't see what this is supposed to be adding. Look at how it works in Soul Reaver. After delivering several strikes, we can see clearly that the enemy is susceptible to being grabbed. There are numerous visual and audio cues that clue us into this. It's now time to perform an execution, something that's crucial to defeating vampires. Raziel now moves smoothly into a grab, and thanks to intuitive controls, can throw the enemies onto spikes or into fires pretty easily. There are some issues with this based on the game's age, but it's all pretty smooth to say nothing of impaling foes with pole arms or cutting off their heads in Soul Reaver 2. Now let's look at Blood Omen 2. After we've wailed on our opponents with a few combos, we can see he's kinda fatigued I guess, maybe moving a little slower. So now check this grab animation. To be honest, the way Kane is hoisting his enemy here is pretty cool. But this is very slow and clunky, and nowhere near as efficient as just laying down another combo once you've got your opening. The game also has a big variety of weapons. That degrade and break. Okay, it's not actually a bag mechanic in this game, as there's always new ones to pick up, and it can keep things fresh for a while. There's a variety of these, and the double sword especially is really cool. Weapons really just vary combat animations and give Kane a little extra reach and damage, but they don't alter anything about how the combat works. Kane can also use several of his dark gifts in battle. These include Jump and TK Blast in a limited capacity, and Fury, Berserk and Immolate directly in combat. TK Blast and Jump are clumsy to use, so are really only good for initiating combat from range. The other three use the Rage Meter which charges every time Kane successfully blocks an attack. These can then be unleashed as powerful, unblockable attacks, which are really cool and satisfying to pull off. So, how does it all fit together? Well, the mid game is the sweet spot. Here you'll be hurtling yourself into groups of enemies from range with jump, blocking combos and deftly zipping around those red unblockable attacks before countering with something devastating of your own. You'll be putting down groups of enemies quickly and efficiently and have a lot of fun at this stage. The late game, however, is a different story entirely. As enemies get tougher and their combo attacks longer, you start to get a real sense of just holding down the block button and just going through the motions. By the final level, I was literally just defending until Immolate was charged and then using that to one-shot anything in front of me. 
To put it simply, this game is far too into its blocking. Kane can only charge his Dark Gifts from blocking. There's no rhyme or reason in the late game to when and how enemies can block you. There's no animation cancelling in this game at all. If someone is attacking you, then you've got to sit through the entire combination and ride it out. You can't even attack when they're winding up for one of those big devastating moves, only dodge around them. You are provided with no opportunities to break your enemy's guard and take the offensive until one of your gifts is charged. And as I said, since Immolate is a guaranteed one-shot, and the late game enemy combinations are so long, why would you choose anything else? It really starts to feel like some kind of turn-based combat system towards the end. You stand around defending while they try their moves, then you in turn fire off yours, occasionally getting a limit break off to tip the balance. The problem is, this is supposed to be a real-time, visceral combat system. We are supposed to be a super badass vampire lord, and none of what I'm doing here is selling me on this. It's a shame because Kane has several powers that, had they just been worked better into the combat, could have been great. Take TK Blast. This would be a great way to stagger blocking enemies and allow us to take the offensive. But because you can't rapid fire this in combat, it's basically useless once enemies are in close. I mean, imagine something like... this. Damn, this is awesome. Or, how about being able to use charm in combat to addle your enemies, so you can break their guard, or even turn them on each other? Kinda like... this. If weapons can be broken, then why not have it so Kane can break enemy weapons and leave his enemies defenseless? There are so many small changes that could rebalance the combat into something much more fun and less grindy. I can write off some of this to its era, though, again, this. And I do applaud developers for trying something new, but they really didn't land this one. The last thing in this section that I want to touch on is stealth. It was kind of common in this era to have contrived sectioned off stealth areas within the game, and they were usually very annoying. Blood Omen 2 actually makes this work really well though, through the use of Kane's mist form. Somewhat nerfed from the last game, this is more like Kane cloaking himself in mist than transforming into it, and as such, there needs to be mist in the area for him to use it. Stealthing allows Kane to perform a stealth kill, and the animation will vary depending on the weapon. This is a fun little system and actually gives justification for contrived stealth sections, and you even have a choice if you want to use it or not. Honestly though, late game, anything that one-shots an enemy and removes another grindy slugfest is very welcome in my book. <laughs> Blood Omen 2 has problems. There were problems when it came out, and as a result, the game has not aged well at all. The story is a mess of bad cliched writing, the character design can at best be described as immature, and the combat, while not without its good points, descends into a grind of blocking and waiting. To top it all off, it really feels like without Kane, these events could have happened in any other fantasy world. It's a shame, because the world and level design are up to a great standard. My experience with this game wasn't terrible, but unlike Deus Ex Invisible War, this is far from being a great game that just happened to be part of a much better series. The events of this story that connect to the main series are interesting, but most of the new characters are forgettable. If you've never played this series, well, as much as it pains me to say this, of any Kane game, you aren't missing much if you skip this one. At best, I'll say this. Go into Defiance after you finish Soul Reaver 2. Then, if you really want more Kane, play this. But, go in with checked expectations. It's not a great time, but it isn't the worst time either. Kane, his true fate stolen by Mobius, now fights for a chance to rewrite his own destiny and spare himself from the hopelessness of being bound to a two-sided coin. The Hilden, residing in the demonic realm, strain against their bindings, desperate to be free. 
Mobius and the Elder God, meanwhile, strive to manipulate the fates of all and end the vampire bloodline so that the Wheel of Fate can turn once again. As the critical moment of Cain's choice comes full circle, Nosgoth calls for a hero to stand against the tyrannical power of oppressive gods and the demented schemes of devils. But the White Knights of Nosgoth have long been slain, and the land is sick and corrupted. As such, the only ones who can answer Nosgoth's call are a blood-drenched vampire king and a soul-devouring wraith spawned from the underworld. But even with Raziel's free will restored to him, to stand against such forces would take a monumental act of defiance.